I finish my workout, we'll start the intro. Mm. Let's say, for instance, you wind up with some old mill syrup. And I'm going to tell you, I know I've said that all the good ones are gone. But some of those old collectors from the 50s are starting to die. So in the shop right now, we want to try to figure out how to make a Springfield that was made in 1876 look pretty decent. What I have here on the table are two Vetterlies that were done, one that's done and one that's not done. And a Springfield, I'd be willing to bet you can see the rust on his butt plate from over there. Down a rabbit hole, we're going to take a trap door all the way apart, clean it, put it back together again, and try to not let anybody know we were ever there. Let's go! Ordinarily, I wouldn't take the butt plate off right away. It's not the first thing we would do, but this is the worst part of the whole gun. And we'll want to get this done first. Okay. So about a half an hour ago, I went ahead and put some angel piss in these slots. And... So what I'm doing here is I'm using the edge of the screwdriver. It might not show up, but I have just dug this screw slot down a good quarter of an inch. It was just full of dirt. There we go. So I don't know if it's showing up real well, but there's a pile. There's a pile of gack right here that was down in that screw slot. Okay. Here we go. There's a pile of garbage down in that screw slot. There we are. We're going to get that right there. Okay. So now that we got that, we're going to see if we're going to get lucky and just put a little bit of torque on this screw head. Plus and minus. We'll try to come off. Oh, man, we got lucky. Look at that. I don't know, luck is when skill and preparedness meet opportunity. But the rest of the gun's going to wind up looking like this. Ugh. Ugh. Okay, so that screw head's a little bit messed up. This is an 1873 trapdoor that was never modernized. So this is not one of the ones that was brought back in and rebuilt. Um, this is one of the ones that was, this is original, the way it originally came out. Low serial number, high arch block, we'll talk about all that. This is one of those guns that's been in a private collection forever and is now seeing the light of day. And it's going to become more and more important that we know how to do the maintenance so that we don't destroy these things. All right, I'm going to lightly tap the butt here because this like Hotchkiss style butt plate in here. We don't want to rip any of this end grain out right where my finger is. So we're just going to apply a little bit of a side to side torque here. Here we go. Yay. Yay. This is a correct butt plate. This bridge was added after the Civil War because they were breaking a lot of them. So this is a correct butt plate here. Correct amounts of rust. <clears throat> this amount of rust is what's going on underneath the butt plate. Every single mill syrup I've ever taken apart. It's very rare when you get them unmolested. <clears throat> we got this out. So now we're going to go back over to the flat part of the bench and start taking this gun apart by the numbers. Ordinarily, I don't do the butt plate first, but... Once you get the um, once you get all the bolts out here, the gun gets really weak right in here, right where this cutout is. So once the barrel comes out of the stock, the stock's got to be handled like eggs. In the shop, I just write the the last three of the serial number down on a piece of tape. As we go, you can you can log stuff, whichever. So uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to take the barrel out of this thing. So we can set it off to one side. Now, something I want to point out here is, if you look at the distance, 
between this tang bolt and the back end of this um, this tang mortise here and you look at the distance from this tang bolt to the muzzle you're going to see that we've got about a 60 to 80 to 1 moment arm here so you never want to take this screw out last you always want to take it out first because i guarantee you six pounds of barrel hanging off the end of that 60 to 1 um, leverage there will break something it will cause something to break so we pull the screw out now we can take off the barrel bands so got to remove the ramrod here in order to get that out of the way cleaning rods are a whole independent story on uh, 73s but we'll take off this band and so far the gun is still okay but once you break this band loose, the stock is in distinct risk here. All right, so let's get that to move. A very light tap. There we go. Now she's moving. That will come off. And you're still holding it. Don't ever turn it loose. Turn it upside down. Give it a little bump on the table. And what we're doing is we're using the weight of the barrel breech assembly in order to knock it loose. Now, in this particular case, we got lucky, man. This thing looks great under the stock line. It looks like it's been used as a wheel chalk for an airplane above the stock line. But that's another story for a different day. We're looking down inside the barrel channel. We're clean here. So, actually... Other than this butt plate looking like it's been stored in salt water, this weapon looks pretty good. But right now, there's not a whole lot of wood between my fingers, right? So this gun is very, very vulnerable to breaking. It's also very vulnerable to twisting. So we got to be careful. So the next thing we'll do here, <clears throat> I'm sorry if I sound like I'm pumping concrete, but Apparently, I had a minor case of pneumonia, and uh, it's walking pneumonia for people with stamina. We'll put that there. Not this one loose. Okay. So, the tang bolt came up inside the trigger group and held it together. And then the fore and aft part <clears throat> of this gun is held together with these screws. And I'll tell you... This gun is very well engineered and it's difficult to put it together again backwards because no two screws or bolts are the same size and they just don't fit. This is going to be very tight. This end grain right here is susceptible to being torn out as we tear it away. So we don't want that to happen. So what we'll do is we'll come in and we'll take the tang bolt very gently set it down in there like this and i'm going to hold my finger over that piece of wood and allow it to get moving and as you can see here pull in on this if you can there's a slight amount of tear out right here you can see where this end grain is starting to pull it up if i'd have just gone in and hit it it would have ripped the wood all the way out polished hammer faces the same thing's going to happen in the back. I'll take my thumb, my finger now, and I'm going to push up here, and I'm going to make the back move. A little bit. Okay, we didn't tear out there. This is all just a very, very, very fine line. But they all do it, all of these mill serves tear out there and I think I got away with this one okay there we go so got it out very little damage here we'll put a little bit of glue up in the end grain here in order to keep this from degrading any further and what does that <clears throat> rust as an oxide occupies more space than the iron does so it actually grows up underneath the wood and it grabs it and cements it. We're going to have the same problem when we try to take these two ferrules out and we have to take them out because they always rust underneath. 
And I cheated there and I put a little bit of coil in either side. Okay, so trigger group here. Now we'll take the stock off and then we'll be done with the, or take the action off and we'll be done. Take these all the way out, run them in about two turns. And again, hold your finger right there because you're supporting the wood. So you know I'm knocking that free. And the same deal over here. Put your finger right there. And all we're doing is we're starting the lock out of the mortise. Because you don't we don't know how long it's been since these things have been out of their mortises. Undo the screws. Screw. Screw. And we just lift the lock loose. And the lock comes loose. Lock is not bad. <clears throat> Underneath where this shoulder is, and we'll tear that down in a minute, I'll show you, it's probably a lot of rust. But this particular stock is in very, very good shape. That's where we're at. The next things we're going to do, we're going to be back up on the universal work holding system. But right now I've got butt plate. And in this group, we're going to put the ramrod lock, the nose cap, the front and rear band holders. The lock is its own group. The bottom metal is its own group. And then this breech block and any sights we may or may not choose to take off, it'll go here. And then this is the stuff we use in order to uh, clamp the whole gun together. So up to the vise here, and we'll talk about taking the breech block out. We're up in the universal work holding system now, and these really early trapdoors, they really didn't want soldiers messing with the rear sights. So these are slotless screws here. And there's a special tool that's spline that drops down over the top of it and rotates. And that's um, something that I don't want to do. I haven't, I took one of them apart and I don't want to take another one apart. So this is something we're not going to mess with. We'll clean this site up in place. We won't go there, but okay. So now we got to take the breech block apart. And um, as we're taking the breech block apart, close it. This is what I found. This prevents stuff from flying all over the shop. Okay. And then we're going to take a punch here. And I might have to reach in front. Get the rest of the way off. There we go. Hang on to this thing so it doesn't come flying out at us. Here we go. That pin comes out. And that pin is trapping the ejector. So when you pop this open, it'll all come back out under spring tension. Bang. Gravity sucks. So up inside this gack encrusted is a bunch of what used to be, that's the ejector spring and ejector plunger. And we can see that while the gun was surface clean, deep down it was nasty. So we got the ejector component and the ejector rides on that pin. We've got the <clears throat> the ejector spring, which is going to snap over center one way or the other. I don't know how well you can see that. And then this block comes apart. There's two screws on it here. This screw comes out. And this will um, allow you to take that apart if it'll come out there. This will pivot out. So this is the lock and block. The whole gun's held together here with that one block. And then this is the spring. Now, I've been finding a lot, you know, these springs get broken. There are a lot of things that happen in there. Now that that's out, early trapdoors had spring-loaded um, firing pins, and they also had some real issues with rapid changes in cross-sectional areas. So we'll pull this out, and we'll see if this one's broken or not. Oh, firing pin's broken off. Oops, that fell on the floor. It's a good time for me to talk about firing pins. These firing pins are supposed to have a spring that's going to return them. So we'll take a look here. Let me rotate this so I can get up in alignment with the camera here, okay? There's a very sharp cross-sectional area change that happens right here. And on these early ones, that would break there. I'm wondering if there's what's left of a spring down on the bottom of this tunnel. No, there isn't. There is no spring in the bottom of the tunnel. Hang on. 
Nope. There's supposed to be a spring here, <clears throat> but this is not an inertial firing pin. This is a later version of the firing pin, and you can see here where they got rid of that step. They got rid of a place for the spring to go, and you'll notice that one isn't broken, and most of these are. Here we have the lock, and we've got it back at full cock, and we've got a spring, uh, a spring cramp. And what we're going to do here is we're going to capture the weight of this spring at full cock like this. We're just going to capture the weight. And then pop the sear and let the hammer down. And when we do that, this spring then allows me to get it out of this hole right here. There we go. Pivot that away and that goes. You can release the spring from this, but in this particular case, we're only doing one gun. So I'm going to leave it in this. And while it's cramped in here, it's fine. You start popping these things in and out of these things and you're going to run yourself into some trouble. Okay. Take off the sear spring. Just come out here. Pop this loose. By hitting the plate this way, here, let me get the light right. By hitting the plate this way, the spring stays put and the plate takes off from behind it and it just knocks that loose and you don't have to put a lot of, um, a lot of hate and discontent into that. That goes away. This particular screw right here we're, we're we're shooting black on black and this is just not looking real good so we're trying to look it up at a monitor trying to keep the light shining off of it so you can see what the hell i'm doing all right there we go sear spring comes out now <clears throat> that screw has got a rather long shank and short threads this one get this out of here this one has a short shank and long threads. So what they've done is, is they've made it impossible to put this lock together the wrong way. So the bridle will come off, and the bridle is the outboard bearing that supports the inside of the, um, the tumbler. And then we'll flip this over, and we're going to have to come up on a vise here, and I'm going to show you what to do, and more importantly, what not to do with the most often broken spring on our screw on any one of these guns I've ever seen. Non-ferrous vice jaws, you can do this in steel, but I wouldn't really recommend it. I've got the toggle folded back up against because I don't want to break it. And we're gonna run it down and we're gonna set it down like that. And we're gonna run this in. We don't have to have it tight, but we're just gonna kind of touch off. So now the lock plate is being supported by the vice jaws. Now we may, we may not get lucky, and we might be able to knock this screw out. Okay, and I'm going to go tight, loose, tight, and you see it's starting to break. And you can see all of the gack coming out of that screw head right there. All right, and this is literally, it's very tight. This screw is never to be used to push the hammer back down onto the tumbler. This screw's function in life is to just maintain casual uh, contact between the hammer and the tumbler. Some locks that have been apart a lot, I would tell you to run them down to right here and tap on this screw to drive this tumbler out. This is a military lock. It is going to take dramatically more force to get this apart, okay? So now the tumbler is flush with the surface and if you look at it you can actually see right there there's one line two lines third line fourth line right i want to take this apart because i want to see what's going on between the hammer and the lock plate so what i'm going to do is back this off a half a turn here and get this good and supported because we are about to knock the terwilligers out of this thing this is not a job for the two ouncer. This is the job for the big mama. I'm gonna get this light up out of the way. We have a punch that's larger than that center hole. Do not stick a punch down in this hole and crack it. Because what you will do, that punch is sticking in right about, uh, let me get the light here. That punch is sticking down to right about there and you will blow the back side of this tumbler off. Will do that. Don't do that. Okay. So we'll stick this back up in here and support it. OK. 
Okay, don't do that. Put that in there like that. All right, Bruno, pull back because I want to show him something. Be up here on the top of the hammer. Okay. So I'm going to take this big hammer and I'm just going to drop it. Bang. Tumbler comes right out, right? There you go. That's what they mean by saying dropping the hammer. So this is why we take our old mill serves apart. All this scrub that's built up in here, this is an oil. That's actually rust standing up above the surface of this. A couple other key things to note. After 1876, 77, they didn't put the date on the lock plate. So we know that this lock plate was built before all the 73s were called back to Springfield. Again, not a history lesson. There's the guys that know, there are guys that know a hell of a lot more about this gun um, than I do, but I had to do a little bit of common research and I can absolutely verify you that Lawrence of Arabia did not run this weapon. We're just gonna get this thing hung in Thor um, and get it started um, so that it'll it, we can just get running on it because I want to boil this thing for probably an hour or two, maybe even three. So we'll run Thor there. And then Bruno, of course, came up with some really off-the-wall Winchester Model 40. Odd. Uh, we just spent, I kid you not, an hour and a half trying to figure out how to take this thing apart. But if you're trying to make any money when you're playing this game, you don't want to double expend resources. So Thor is hot, so we're going to go ahead and hang two barrels, two actions off of this. And um, we'll let that run. And then I'll come back and we'll finish taking the, the lower trigger group apart. And we'll get a small pot up. We'll talk about all that stuff. These are special screws that required me to make a screwdriver. And why do I want to take these off? Because I want to see what's going on up underneath. Um, so a little bit of torque here and they'll break. You don't need to gorilla. I, I just bumped the camera there. You don't need to gorilla these screws on really hard because I've seen these things split. They've been run down so damn hard. They just don't need to be that way. I'm just going to give it a little bit of torque there. Okay. But you got to have this screwdriver. That's the only way to really take these off the right way. Let's just take a screwdriver trip and go ahead and grind it. And that's what you use your moto tool for is to do that. Now, this is kind of spring loaded a little bit. So if you push on it, let's see here. We can give it a light tap with a hammer, I guess. And then give it a little spring. It'll usually just pop right out for you. There we go. Okay. Now this screw has been mushroomed out the back. They did not want that screw coming out. And I'm not going after that one right there. We'll get this because we can move it. We'll be able to get all the gack out from underneath that. Um, this isn't too bad. The last one of these I took apart. This was all just just orange ooze all over it that leaves us the trigger there is a um small screw here and we'll pop it you'll notice that very very few of these fasteners are the same size and again we're right back to the fact they made it difficult to put this gun together they made it kind of squatty proof private proof give a have a private three ball bearings and within five minutes of lost one broken one and figured out a way to get the other one pregnant so this screw right here holds on the nose cap it doesn't have a tremendous amount of threaded surface but that will pop this wood is not very thick so when you put this back in don't grill it is now you'll see the shine on this let me get this right there's a shiny spot that runs fore and aft on this screw. Let me get away. So you see the shiny spot turning? There you go. See that shiny spot turning? When you're done assembling this, that shiny spot's going to need to be fore and aft because the screw is dished. 
ever so slightly for the barrel to go over the top of it and the barrel keeps it from rotating so now gotten that all the way out i'm just going to gently push up from underneath here and pop that out and there it is okay and then this just slides off that takes me to another uh slightly tricky deal here you see that silver line right there they all break right there all of these pieces break this is not a spring but it is a double-ended part that fits down inside of a mortise here and then this is the piece that hangs onto the ramrod all right right there like that you see bang so what i'm surmising happens is if this gun gets hit if this ramrod gets hit or thrown down in the hole there is a tremendous torque there's a torque that wants to bend this like this and it bends that piece up and snaps it off right there so we want to be trim we want to be careful as we're pressing this out but we can't press it out yet because it's held in position by this band so I gotta figure out if I can show you this okay here's the band right so that goes through so there is an entry hole down here and inside that entry hole as I'm see that popping up now you got to be careful you don't tear the grain out here and some of these ones that have been in here for a long time they'll actually rust into their holes there's always corrosion here but these things you'll find these things are so badly corroded that they're just hanging onto the wood and then we can just gently press up on this until that'll come out right there so this is the piece that hangs onto the ramrod and the really early ones have a patent date there but almost all of the earlier versions of this that silver line right there tells me you see it's bent you can actually see it being bent and it's trying to heave it up because it's rotating around this axle hole here and it's trying to rotate and pop it up something to look at now notice while we're working on this stock right now there's nothing supporting this stock so we have to be very careful how we're going all right we're going to do a camera move now and move over to the other side of the bench So once you start to lift it, give it a little twist. That'll just make sure that it's broken anything in the hole loose. I find a lot of corrosion underneath these uh, stock bolts. The first thing we're gonna do here is lightly, we're not marking the wood, but we're just lightly Tapping the wood to break the end grain loose. These have had a tremendous amount of torque put on them. And they've compressed the wood this way. So you're going to want to make sure that we just break the wood loose on the end grain. Okay. It's not very thick. Come in there. Come in there and what that did was undercut the wood ever so slightly to allow me to bring this punch up in here push on it that way the bottom of it which bends it over now i'm going to bend this around a little bit into a slightly uncomfortable setup here okay to show you what i'm doing so here's the punch in the hole we put it in and then I'm going to take the bottom of the punch and I'm going to go that way with it. And as I do that, you can see it get up underneath, right, to where I can just lightly tap it. You can see there's end grain trying to get, a, get out of here on all of this. So now I'm going to obscure this, but you put your thumb over it. And you push down on that end grain so that it has a harder time tearing out. And once you've done that, 
Now I've got that ferrule up about here and we can see there's rust all over it. And this rust oxide jacks, the rust occupies more volume than the iron does. So now once we got it loose, you can see that there's an anti-rotation divot on that. In that, if you really look at it, I'll see if we can find it right there, right on the edge of that umbra. You can actually see my very light punch indent. So now we know when we put the gun back together again, how that goes in. We'll pull this one out and we're gonna throw everything in the pot. So we've got it laid out, you know, on this tray in sort of its component as we tore it down. So we've got everything that went on the stock, nose cap, ferrules, butt uh, screws. Now we've got the butt plate hanging with the barrel. We've got the two uh, barrel band locks and then we've got the nose screw. For the lock, we've got the, uh, the hammer, mainspring, lock plate with all this gack on it, tumbler, um, sear, bearings, screws. Trigger guard, bottom metal, trigger. The two screws that hold the trigger guard in, the two ferrules. This little itty bitty thing, I don't know why, but they seem to get through the T-ball, so I just leave it there. High arch, breech block, very early. Square front, very early. Color case hardened with the small 1873 and then the eagle over crossed arrows in the US. Yeah, you want to talk about on titanium. Nice. All right, and here's the stuff. Even though this firing pin is broken, we're going to throw it in there, throw that there. We may have to do something about that firing pin. Okay, and then we had the two barrel bands, and then the very last thing that we're going to put in is that screw. So this is going to go back and get boiled um, so that that's running while we do the stock. I've got the lights turned off, and we're a little contrasty here. But there's a stock cartouche right here, and it's the final proof firing mark. There's another one here. Somebody stamped a letter on it. There's all kinds of marks all over this gun, and you got to be very, very careful that you don't mess them up when you do what I'm about to talk about. So if you're going to steam dents up, if you're going to do that kind of stuff, remember that all of these markings are dense. They're just impact marks, so be pretty careful about what you're doing. The reason why I don't talk about stocks too much is the condition of the stock isn't degrading. It's not actively um, corroding. It's not being messed up. So what's going on is whenever you work on a stock, the only time a stock gets messed up is when it gets used. So the very worst I do, and this is why I don't talk about them too much, is I just peel off with a little bit of four-aught steel wool and we're just going to take this finger oil and all the gack off the top of this. All right? We don't want to take much more than that off. Now, that leaves the tricky conversation about dents. And I've done dents before for you guys, but I've never done dents on a gun where I cared about the underlying finish as much as I care about it on this particular trapdoor. I know I'm going to put a layer of oil on this stock. And I also know that if I go after a dent like this, that I'm going to lift some of the sheen off the stock and that a lot of this dirt and this finger oil is going to wind up in this towel. Again, remember that stock cartouches are dense. So all I'm doing is going after the really, really deep stuff. We're not going after the small surface dents. We're just going after the really deep stuff. The deep dents have torn wood fibers. And the torn wood fiber needs to be protected. And we're going to put some clear Danish oil on this gun. And we're going to go ahead, and, which is essentially what it was finished with. Danish oil is essentially uh, linseed oil with a little bit of turpentine in it. <clears throat> That's an, overally, an overly dramatic simplification. <clears throat> Sorry guys, I've been getting over a three-week cold here. I essentially had pneumonia, and I'm not, 
I, I sound way worse than I feel. So all I've done by doing this, and I've shown this in other videos, is lightly brought up the thick parts. Now, while that's doing that, I'm going to put away my towel. I'm not going to do this whole stock. We don't have all day to watch this. If you commit to steaming a stock, you will lift the surface layer. You will lift that surface sheen off. Now that can be brought back. But what I'm telling you is, if you have like a, you know, one of the prototype Ross Mark IVs out of Canada, don't do this. But I'm gonna bring this finish back with original finishing methods. We're just gonna oil it. As you see here, that buff down, so don't panic. Just go ahead and buff it down. In keeping with the true original character of the gun, and my hands are in the way, well, we're gonna throw some Danish oil on here, which again is linseed oil. And the way these guns were finished originally, they were just dunked in a tank of linseed oil. They were not, you know, somebody didn't sit here and put eight or 10 coats on it and run it in. So this is how the weapon would have been originally finished. So we've stripped the surface dirt off of this thing, steamed up a couple of really, really heinous dents in this area that were in deep. And these guns have been handled a lot, so they've got a lot of dents on them. And now you would just let this oil sit here and let it absorb. And as it absorbs, the wood will take on this luster and then we'll let it set. There you go, 10 minutes have elapsed. We're gonna come in with a rag now and just buff this out. And you gotta admit, and we've nourished the wood, we've protected the areas of the wood that were Dented and damaged, but we've not altered the essential character of the weapon. So like I said, I don't talk about doing wood much because I don't do the wood much. But in this particular case, this gun it needed doing. And you got to admit, I think that looks pretty good without... You can sand this thing all the way down to zero and start over again. But that's really not the point of all this, now is it? This is what these parts look like with no oil on them. So not only have we boiled them, but we've converted them out. And now we have parts with no oil on them. Let's get up to the wheel and um, I'll show you a couple of things. Here's the part. And all of this is loose on the surface. As we run through, We've converted all of those oxides over and got all that off the surface and that pops out. No chemicals, no, um, no abrasives. So remember I was talking about this particular part here. If we just get the top, flip it over, get the bottom, we've got darn near all of it. And you can get up in there with this wheel This is what takes the longest. It takes me almost an hour to do all of the parts for one of these guns, but you gotta admit, that looks a lot better. So if you remember the lock plate, and the lock plate had all this mung on it. <coughs> the lock plate had all this mung on it. But that, that's all been converted out now to a loose oxide. We didn't have to use anything aggressive Bang, that lock plate pops right back in from the dead. 
I think it looks pretty good, personally. Let me get this done. We'll go on to one more piece. Then I think we're going to go get that butt plate. Take a look at what happened, because the butt plate was the worst of everything on the gun. But as you can see, that cleaned right up. That looks great. No abrasives. This wheel's real soft. You try this on a regular wire wheel, you'll pull back a bloody stump. Oh my God, that looks like a disaster. And to be really honest, it kind of is. And I'm going to discuss something about this conversion process that we don't typically talk about. And it's what to do with rust that is so deep and so thick and so hard you can't deal with it. There is a way to deal with it. And I'm going to let you in on that secret now. So as we're wheeling all this off, some of the original beauty of this butt plate starts showing through. And the reason why these butt plates look like this is they get grounded in a mud. You're standing at attention. Okay, see this internal, this internal oxide's popping right off. This isn't red rust we're taking off. What it essentially is is mud. So a lot of this will come off, but some of it won't. And I don't really know how to show this on a video. Um, this is one of those things you just have to be in my shop looking at. Let me get up in here. All right, there we go. So the inside of this butt plate came out looking really good. But there's a lot of this oxide that's sticking up above the surface. So I grabbed a ball peen with the polished face and I'm actually hitting this oxide and I don't know how this is showing up on camera but that oxide is actually turning orange we're knocking the surface of it off you gotta have a polished hammer face for this or you're putting marks all over this here's another one here now, back in the day, the collectors would have had a heart attack if you were to ever take a wire wheel to this. And I got news for you, you don't really have to. So I'll keep doing this. This butt plate's going to get run back through with another couple of guns. We'll probably have to run this three or four times and repeat this until we're down flat. Now, you can come in with a more aggressive wheel here. You're going to leave white spots, and you can rust blue over those white spots. Not within the scope, but I've got to kill every last ounce of rust on these guns because this particular gun probably hasn't been taken care of in 140 years, and i got to milk another 100 out of them. This trigger guard screw... The reason why I have this chisel out here is so that we can dig down in here and we can get all the garbage out of these slots. And I mean, you're pulling like little chunks of rock and all kinds of crap out of here. And then you let the bristles do the work. So you let the bristles roll in. Look at that. up with that so you start with this is what the fastener looked like after we boiled all of the oil off of it and converted all of the oxides that were on it and you wind up with something that looks like this now in this particular case this is the screw that was on the rear end of the gun not the one that was up in the top because you can see where it's been ground down into the mud for years. But that's just how that cookie crumbles. So let's go to something that's a little bit messed up here. Less messed up. Bottom metal. Now the bottom metal was protected. So it's probably not as 
roughed up here. That is what most of y'all's mill serves look like underneath all that patina. And I'm back to, will somebody please tell me when not taking care of something makes it more valuable? So I gave this bad boy another oil in here. The beauty of an oil finish is that we can put this gun together while this is wet. Um, but I gave it one more and you can it really, really, really nourished the uh, the look of this stock. So we're there. I got up inside the barrel channels. I went up inside the mortises. I got in everything and let the oil soak in because it stabilizes this wood. Wood is a living thing. Even when it's dead, this is just a big bunch of soda straws uh, all bundled together. So what we want to do is fill those soda straws up full of um, full of an oil that will go into that wood, nourish it, harden off, and, and, and keep the wood um, in, a, in a better place. Okay, so we got all our parts back, and um, I, I've laid them out in functional groups. This is like we did before. The first one you took off the breech block, the bottom metal, the lock, and then all the parts that sit on the stock. And while we were doing this, my neighbor to the rear who owns a CNC router made us this sexy looking anvil gunsmith and board here. And you gotta admit, this is pretty high speed. So we're gonna break off here for a second. I'm gonna let you guys watch that. I'm gonna start oiling this and we'll come back. That's pretty neat, huh? That took about 45 minutes in real time. We sped that up like 5,000 times to um, get that to fit inside the video. But it's pretty neat. You can just start out with a flat piece of MDF and a drawing, and 45 minutes later, you got something with your, with your logo on it. Again, this is a motor oil or like a lawnmower oil with no detergent in it. Just for the first time. You can go back to gun oils after you're done. And... It, it, all we're trying to do, the detergents want to remove bluing. Well, you can see there's no bluing coming off of my hands, so we know we did a good job of wire wheeling. And this finish isn't going anywhere. And what kills me is underneath the barrel, you look at that black, and that entire weapon looked like that when it was brand new. And now we're getting back to having done the maintenance. Um, I also get asked what the right amount of oil to leave inside of a mechanism is. And I will demonstrate this here. We'll throw a bunch of oil up inside here and we'll just get this, this bottom plate here oiled off. And then um, uh, hand me that hose, please, if you wouldn't mind. We got that in here. Bruno's gonna retrieve my air hose for me. And I would tell you that about the right amount of oil to leave on any gun part, It's about that much. Let me get this thing oiled and we'll start putting it back together again. The first sub-assembly we're going to put together is going to be the lock. And I wanted to start over here at the bench because I wanted to show you that while I've got this hammer on this tumbler, it's still got a long way to go. You are not going to drag this onto this with that screw. What you're going to do is lay it up here in your vise and we're going to watch the tumbler move and we're going to lay it right in there like that 
That brought us up smooth. You don't need to kill it, grind on it, try to snap this off. But that, especially on a military weapon, is going to have to be done. We had to drop a five-pound hammer on it to get it apart. You know where that goes. All right, now we're back over at our parts tray. On top of the tumbler, we're going to go ahead and stick the bridle on. And let me get my hands out of the way here. So that supports the inside, and then as the tumbler goes through the lock plate, the outside is supported. This lock has three different length screws on it. Let me line them up here and get my hands out of the way. And you can see there's a short one, an intermediate long, and a long one. The long one is the bearing for the, the sear. The parts count on this gun is amazingly low. Every single part does exactly what it's supposed to do. No more and no less. And it also is set up. You can see the shorter screw has a step here. And it comes up flush on the outside of the lock plate. If you try to put the long screw there, the hammer won't move. They've really got you set up in such a way that it's difficult to mess this up. Now, you put that screw in, make sure the sear is free to move. You can crank down on this enough to where it freezes the syrup, and we don't want to do that. So we'll just bump it off and let that be free to move. And then we'll set set the uh, the spring in there. And I don't know, I know, don't know how well this is showing up this far away, but this spring, you don't try to put this spring in that notch. There's no way you're going to put this spring in that little notch. So let me get it started here, and then I'll show it to you, because I know my hands are in a way. All right. You put that screw on until you can just get that little alignment bob up over the top. And then it just snaps in. And then you can tighten this the rest of the way up. See, I didn't have to fight it. I didn't have to use the spring cramp. I didn't have to do anything. And now we have distinctive clicks. We bring that all the way down. We still got the spring captured in the cramp. We grab the hook here. That alignment part's got to go in that hole, so that's going to go right there. And then we're going to cock the hammer, so let me get lined up here. We're going to cock the hammer all the way back to full cock. That takes most of the tension off, and bang. And now we can bring it down to the bottom and bring it back up to half cock, which is where we've got to have it to put it on the gun. Last thing we were missing was this screw. And then we'll be done here. Hang on a minute. I'm having a low dexterity day. Okay. This screw cannot be used to crank this, uh, crank this hammer back down on the tumbler. Okay. So that's one assembly done. The second subassembly is going to be the trigger in the trigger plate. Now, modern cameras cell phone cameras at L have made this job a lot easier because if you take some photographs of an unfamiliar gun as it's coming apart it makes it a lot easier to see as it's going back together again free to move this all cleaned up beautifully okay now this is going to require us to spring the trigger guard that way a little bit again I'm trying to let you guys see what I'm doing, which makes it harder for me to do. All right, so we sprang it and it went up in. And I'm going to tell you, some of you guys may have detected that I'm not feeling the greatest here. And my grip strength is gone. So I'm going to admit to having just grabbed this in the uh, work holding system and squeezed it ever so slightly to get it to pop in. It's not much. And then we made a special screwdriver. Oh, look. Trapdoor special tools. Who knew? We made that special screwdriver so we can come on up on these um, on these slotted screws and just you don't have to kill them. You just got to bring them up until they stop turning. So here we go. There we go. So now this sub assembly is put together. Now we move up here to the breech block. You don't have to do it in this order, but you got to do it in some order. Now. I'm going to put this firing pin back in this gun because it does still technically work like this. 
However, for this particular customer, I'm going to go back and make them another firing pin and then go back through and replace them, you know, replace it. So that firing pin has got to go in. And the reason why it's got to go in first is you can't get this little trapdoor gizzy to go back together again unless that screws in. They thought this gun out. They thought it out hard. So here you have the round part and the round part. You lay that up like that, and then it will go in at an angle, and it'll fit in, it'll snap down, and there is only one way for it to go. This particular screw is the only screw in the gun that isn't blued, and it's got a special head shape, and it does not fit in any other holes on the gun. So if it fits here, you know you got it. You bring that down, okay, and then... The entire gun is locked and shut on this surface right here. One of the problems with these with these trapdoors is every now and then somebody will drop a 4570 lever evolution into this thing. And the gun's not designed to handle that pressure. And you just got to make sure that you don't do that. And I know that sounds a little simplistic, but don't do that. Okay. This spring slides up into that hole, and then this plunger here is going to bear in this hole. So that's either snapped, I'll do it this way, that's either snapped in or out. So it kind of goes over center like that, all right? And it gives you a snapping action that spanks the round out. The round will come flying out of the chamber and it'll hit this ejector stud and it'll kick the rear end up and off it goes. So we stick that in there and we stick the ejector back in it. And this is the way I found that these breech blocks go back together again the best way. Put that up in there. Let me get this up. You can't see what I'm doing and there's no way I can show you. You gotta have that little spring pointed up to the top in that little indent in the in the e, um, ejector and then you can take the breech block and push all of this in and I'll get my hands out of the way and I'll show you what I'm doing here in a minute it's a very stiff spring so now I have the ejector in and I have the breech block closed, which allows me to put the assembly pin in without a whole lot of agita. There's a projection here. And you want to make sure that that projection lines up with that hole. If you don't, you will bend this. Don't do that. Okay, so now that we got this, if you watch, the top of the block hits it, snaps over, bottom of the block hits it, snaps back out. So now we got that done. <clears throat> and now that we have that done, bottom metal made, we can do this. All of these holes are capturing the screws, they're capturing the screw for the trigger. This is a very, very, very well thought out gun. Okay, so that goes in there. And then the wood screws hold the bottom metal on. Now you're putting this in first, because we gotta have somewhere for that, for that tang bolt to go. So we'll stick this in here and just come up on it. Let me get my hands in the way here. Very difficult to do that. All right, that screws in. No, it's not the right size screwdriver. And no, I'm not putting a tremendous amount of torque on this either. Okay, hang on a minute. There it is. That's the right size screwdriver. Now, you see how the blade on this is way too wide? <clears throat> if I went down far enough, this blade would scrape on the top, and we don't want to do that, so... We'll get a screwdriver that's not as wide. I know I got my finger in the way, and we'll just walk it up till it stops. I've turned now to show you a couple of things that I want to put back in the stock. 
The band retention screws or screws, listen to me, springs. They're both the same size and they go in one there. And then this is the ramrod retention device that's gonna be held in by that band screw going through it. So we'll stick that down inside the stock there where that goes. And then we'll put this band, uh, this band retention spring in there. And now the combination of the barrel being on top of it and the band retention spring, now you know you got it held, nose cap goes on. Remember we got the special screw with the little silver streak through it. Um, and that'll tell you that that's where the barrel was. Press that down in there. Find the bottom of that slot. This is not a screw you gotta kill. This is just a screw that's gotta line up and go down. There we go, I think I got it. There we go, that's us right there, okay. Now, <clears throat> last but not least, we have one, I'm sorry, two spots. So we know the two spot one, spots went to the bottom and those little retention gizmos that keep it from rotating line up. And then there's one spot, one spot there. Let me make sure that those line up. So we didn't destroy anything and all the contours match. That's a victory right there. Once you set the barrel in there, grab this thing and don't turn it loose till you're all the way done. Because right now you have the weight and the leverage to break this. On these barrel bands, there's a little U on them. We'll take a still photograph of it and show you. That U on this band is pointing up. That U has to be in a place that when the gun is standing up in a stack configuration, the U is facing up. And that's how you know because these bands are tapered. They're slightly larger at the rear than the front. The front band you can typically tell because the stacking swivel will be in the front, but there's a little U on this one also. And that runs up in there. Now the gun is stable. Once you get that band on, the gun is stable. Now we can tack this screw in and tighten the whole gun up. So let me get that there to go down. Caveat when you're putting on the lock is this trigger is free to move. So if you try to pound this lock in with the trigger back like this, the end of the sear tail will push in on a trigger. So you got to make sure the trigger is forward. The lock is at half cock and polished hammer face. You can just sort of honk down on that. <clears throat> Screws are identical. So I'm holding my finger across the back of this. Wrong screwdriver, sorry. Holding my finger across the back of that and I'm feeling the plate. The screw is grabbing the plate and pulling it up and it's flush here. Sometimes when these guns get really dry, you'll get a little bit of reveal down here. And then we got another, that's another discussion for a different day. Okay, hold on here. Okay. I know my hands are in a way, just relax. All right. So that screw in, this screw in. I have absolutely cranked the crap out of nothing on this gun. Just bring them up till they're tight and stop. The early guns you could get open at half cock. The later versions of this had the half cock up here and it had a, a half cock down here so you couldn't open the gun up. This one is so early it has a two click cock on it. Okay, we're good. And set it down. Last thing we're gonna do, we gotta go back over to the vise. The end grain on this stock is actually very fragile. We could we could knock shards off of this if we, and you can see it's been beat up. So I always put butt plate screws on, put the top one on first. There's a gap that might open up here when we tighten down on it. So let's let, let's get this down first. And I'll show you why we're putting on the top one first all the time. And the reason is, is that when you come down on this, this gap opens up. Well, it's far easier 
to pull this gap out with this much leverage than it is to pull it out with that much leverage. This, of course, was the screw that had really been kind of fragged up a little bit. And it's, it's there, and we're just going to go ahead and run it home. And you'll see that that gap will just disappear when I honk down on it. Don't kill these screws either. Just bring them. Honk her down till she squeaks. And then another quarter turn is the, um, the Torx spec on the head bolts of a Chevrolet 350, not on a butt plate of a mill serve. The weapon does not know how old it is. As long as you use the correct ammunition, lead slug, 405 green, black powder, insert close. Gun does not know how old it is. And if you don't hit it, you scare it to death. Ejection is good. I have one more. Again, correct ammunition. Make sure the breech block is down. Back to full cock. Again, if you don't hit it, make sure it dies of smoke inhalation and third degree burns. So we've done the maintenance. We've converted red oxide to black oxide. We've gotten down underneath the stock line on a mill serve that probably hasn't been taken care of in a long time. So as always, whenever you're in close quarters and you run out of ammo, fix bayonets and 